Hi. Uh, as Jasmine uh, said, I'm Data. Tonight we're going to be learning about lock picking forensics. It's okay. There's no electrons involved in what you're going to learn tonight. It's okay. You'll be all right. I promise. No LEDs, unfortunately. Um, but I think together we'll get through it. So uh, everybody always wants me to put this slide in. I usually delete it, but after many requests, I put it back in. Uh, about me, data, I'm a covert entry specialist. One of the parts of that is that I specialize in forensic locksmithing, which we'll learn about tonight. Aside from that, I do a lot of security research uh, and a lot of digital security as well, so not just physical stuff. Uh, as Jasmine said, I run Layer 1. I'm one of the founders of Null Space Labs here in LA. Ask me more about myself after, I suppose. What are we going to learn about today? So I know, uh, show of hands, how many of you know how a lock works and how to pick it? I like how, at the first part, you guys did not raise your hand, and then I said how to pick it, and then suddenly three-fourths of the crowd know. That's a little concerning, but it's OK. We got you covered. Uh, we're going to about learn about basic pin tumbler locks, which is like the, the standard lock 90% of the world uses. We're going to learn about lock picking. Uh, the first two items we're going to try and get through in about 90 seconds to 120 seconds, because we have other stuff to actually talk about. So sorry if you're new. Um, and then we're going to talk about forensics and some other met methods of entry. Questions are OK. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. The only game I don't want to play is the what if game. So being forensics, all of you being intelligent, curious, creative, thinking people, you have a tendency to go, well, what if I 3D print something and then shrink wrap it and then put foil on it? And does that leave forensic marks? That's the only game I don't want to play tonight, at least during the talk, um, because we get into this problem of infinite possibilities and infinite answers. So before we get into that, let's talk about what is forensic locksmithing. So it's this idea that by examining locks, keys, access control devices, you can find evidence of things other than normal use. So for key-based things, this would be use of a key is the only thing that is considered normal use, right? Um, who does this? So insurance companies do this, governments do this, law enforcement does this. Uh, it's really only at a high level, right? So if your door is kicked in, you're not gonna need a forensic locksmith to know what happened, right? <laughs> I, typically. There was a very high-profile case about 10 years ago of a burglar who did pick locks and then kicked the door in after the fact um, in Europe, and that was actually very interesting. But other than that, other than the one person in six billion doing this, uh, you, you probably will not have need of a forensic locksmith during your life. But for very high-profile, again, government, military type things, this does come up. Um, so let's talk about how locks work. So this is what's called a pin tumbler lock. Again, 90% of the world uses this lock. Uh, the outer piece here, called the cylinder, inner piece called the plug. Easy way to remember this is that there's a hole in the cylinder plugged by the plug. Obviously, you all have used a key at some point in your life. Uh, you all, I, I assume, have some kind of property or something that you secure via a key. So hopefully, you've met a lock and a key before. This one's pretty easy, keyhole. Everybody familiar with that? The pattern of cuts on the keyhole is what differentiates you know, lock brand A's key from going the lock brand's B lock. Um, inside, there's a series of chambers. A typical lock has five, sometimes four, sometimes six, sometimes seven chambers. Inside each of the chambers is a set of pins and a spring, and the spring pushes it down to its default position. Um, in other parts of the world, for example, the Netherlands, they don't mount the locks the same way we do in the US. So this is the typical kind of North American configuration, right? We have the keyhole at the bottom, the pins going up, and the spring goes with gravity. Other parts of the world, they rotate this. It doesn't have an impact on the lock functionally, um, and some people think, well, don't I need gravity? No, that's the point of the spring, is to push everything to its default position. The easy way to remember what's what is that the red pin is called the key pin because it physically comes in contact with the key. The blue pin is called the driver pin because it drives the key pin down via the force of the spring. I didn't go to school, so there's probably a lot of these terms that are wrong. Uh, however, I am an expert. So without a key, without a key, uh, there was no forensic locksmithing school at the time, if that makes sense. Uh, without a key, the animations don't work, apparently. Oh, that's weird. Why don't they work? That's going to be awful awkward if none of them work. 
All right, now we, we are in need of technical help from the hackers here. Why wouldn't it work? See, it works there, but it doesn't work there. That's interesting. Okay, guess we're watching it like this, because technology. Hmm, isn't that curious? Anywho, so uh, what, Without a key, if this one wants to work, the idea is that the blue pin by default, the driver pin, blocks rotation of the plug. And on the back of the lock is something that connects to the actual bolt work, so the shackle, the latch, the deadbolt, depending on the type of lock, right? So physically prevents you from rotating, right? Now the purpose of the key is that the key, each of the cuts on the key correspond with one of the chambers in the lock, and it raises that set of pins to the point where the key pin and the driver pin meet at the point where the cylinder and the plug meet. Does that make sense? Simple mechanical idea. Now in a typical lock there's again five pin stacks, something like this. Uh, some of the other things you'll note is that there's some lips and other things around it so that you can't just shove a shim in there and figure out where everything's supposed to go. The purpose of the key is to come in here and again different cuts on the key correspond to different sizes of the key pin all of this is stopped by the shoulder of the key, which is this square protrusion here. That tells it to s register against the face of the lock so that all the cuts on the key are in the correct position relative to all the components in the lock. And if everything's at the right height, then the, lock can, the plug can rotate, interface with the bolt mechanism. Now there's two kind of failure modes, right? So in any of the chambers, one of the pin sets can be too low, causing the driver pin to block. Or a key pin can be too high causing the key pin to now block you from rotating. So all of these have to be in the right position. It's not a matter of just shoving something in the lock and raising it up, because those would be bad locks and, and we don't want that, right? So in, in like a very logical way, when you look at a lock, you might think the way this works is that this is the top view of the plug. So these are all the chamber holes, all the pins and springs sit in. When you turn the plug, maybe with the wrong key or with a screwdriver or something, it's very logical to assume that all of these are checked for being in the right position at the same time, but that's not true. So the real world is very poorly made Chinese locks, and even the most perfectly made, expensive, infinite money lock would wear down over time and start displaying tolerance. So when you machine something, as many of you know here uh, at the Hackaday Lab, you have to specify a tolerance with which all the things are aligned and sized and so on. The same is true of a lock. So Realistically, all of the chambers are a little bit off symmetrically. They're different sizes. The pins themselves can be bigger, smaller, more oval than round, and so on and so on. So what ends up happening is that when the lock is turned, it's not five pins being checked at once. It's one pin checked at a time in series based on all these small mechanical tolerance imperfections, right? So to, to help uh, enhance this idea, imagine the gray square here is the wall of the cylinder coming to check if everything's in the right spot. So in our very zoomed in view, one of these is more to the left, for example. So that's checked. And if that's in the right position, then it can continue on and check the next and the next and so on. And the key's job is to make sure that all of the pins are at the right height and it feels to you very seamless when you just turn it and it works, right? Does this make sense so far? All right, that's how locks work. That's all you need to know about locks. As far as lock picking, lock picking is this idea of applying torque, which causes the act of binding. This is the, the lock checking if each of the pins is in the right position. And then a manipulation tool, typically called a pick, comes in and you check to feel which of these is binding based on the pressure and feel of how springy it is. So when it's being checked, the two walls of the plug and cylinder are biting against it, causing friction and a different feel to the person doing the manipulation. And then from there, you develop a mental map in your head of what you have put in the right place, what you haven't, and so on and so on. And you work your way through the lock methodically. Or you do what most of you probably learned, which is this idea of raking, where you just shove something in the lock very rapidly in an attempt to brute force it. Make sense? Everybody know how to pick locks now? Good. 
So as far as forensic locksmithing, what we're trying to do is, number one, determine the method of entry used to open a lock. So obviously it's not just lock picking, it's not the only way to open a lock. There's many variations, we'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, we want to identify any tools or techniques used, potentially time requirements to help paint a portrait for investigators, uh, any skill requirements, any like literal gear requirements, um, and any evidence. So there's very small trace evidence often, often left behind. Uh, keys specifically are something that you handle, you put in your pocket, which has a lot of things tying you to places, right? In terms of trace evidence, uh, hair, fiber, blood, so on, right? Um, aside from that, it's just pre preparation of an investigative report, potentially expert testimony in court. Uh, as many of you, even though you guys are like super intelligent, technically minded people, many of you coming into this may not know how a lock works. And the same is true of a, of a jury, may need explanation of such evidence and why this is the way it is and possibilities and so on. So in terms of like how this is categorized, there's three methods of entry. Destructive, I think fairly easy to understand. Destructive, very obvious that it was manipulated open or damaged in some way. Covert refers to something that the user cannot see, but a forensic inspection will, will typically uncover. And then there's surreptitious, which is a method of entry where it's very difficult or impossible to tell that it happened. So the, the, very, the, the simplest example of this is somebody looking at you wearing your keys on your belt, which, sorry if you are after this talk, but uh, people can look at your key, see what the pattern of cuts is, make a duplicate key with that pattern of cuts, then use it. And it's very difficult to determine that that happened outside of some, some very specific edge cases. Uh, and then there's also like this idea of real life versus forensic. So as far as my job, I'm not doing blood analysis, I'm not doing the ballistics wires or anything else, right? I'm only focused on locks and keys and things that assist somebody else in figuring this out, right? I am not Columbo, despite my looking like Columbo. Um, and then, again, there's also this like CSI versus forensic locksmithing thing where people assume like the most complicated, expensive forensics tests are done. But if the, the case is for a $5,000 theft or something like this, right, they're not going to spend $80,000 on a very complicated scientific forensic test, right? So just kind of the realities of, you know, life. Um, any questions so far? I promise it gets more interesting. So uh, when I started this, this was roughly 2007-ish. Um, there's no published information on this. I knew it was a thing. Obviously, people did this before I got interested in it. But I couldn't find any info. So I did what every hardworking hacker does. And I said, I'm going to buy thousands of locks and do things like this. So what does the lock look like new under a microscope? This is to give myself a baseline, right, for what is normal. Uh, so this is what a pin, a key pin looks like normal. You can see that there's some machining marks, some artifacts left behind by the machining on the, the tip of the pin. Closer up, you can see these a little bit better. Now. Same is true for keys, obviously. And all of these are made in a different way, and the, the method by which they're manufactured has an effect on what they look like new and so on, how they wear. The materials make a difference. Every little piece kind of figures in. This is the face of the plug, to give you an idea. And then I did what every hardworking hacker does. I said, I'm going to turn the key in the lock and take it in and out of the lock as many times as I can stand. So here's what the pin looks like after 100 uses. You'll see a pattern of wear starting. Now these are brass pins, if you're interested, versus a brass key. The keys are typically cast, whereas the pins can be either cast or part cast, part machined, fully lathed, so on and so on. Anyways, a pattern of wear appears. A little bit closer, you can see it differently under a different kind of light source. This is the same ring. Key starts to wear down as well. 1,500 uses, this is pin one, so this is the pin closest to the face of the lock. Starts to wear down very dramatically, right? You see almost all the machining marks are gone. Pin five, however, is different. Does anybody know why? Pin five is the one in the furthest back of the lock. Sorry, he raised his hand. Y your answer is correct, but I think it's phrased a little wrong. So the, the answer is that the key itself touches pin one with the whole key in and out whereas the pin in the back of the lock is just hit, touched by the tip of the key during normal operation, right? So you could see there's a couple different things. So number one is that obviously it's a lot less worn. Number two is that the actual marks are much more scratch-like. This is caused by 
in relation to this, the tip of the key wears down much faster than the, the one closer to the bow of the key, the part that you hold. So it's more likely to be jagged and scratchy as opposed to the, the other thing. Key, this is the tip of the key, starts to develop crevices. Uh, the black is uh, lubricant or brass on brass action. 5,000 uses. Yes, this is all done by hand. I did not, I was not smart enough to build a robot to do this at the time. And also, I told myself at about like 3,000 in, it's more realistic this way. So pin one, uh, obviously the machining marks have fully worn down and you'll see a second ring of wear starting. So this is why a very old, very used lock starts to not work with the key because the, the pieces of it start physically wearing down such that the alignment of everything and what the key's supposed to do starts to be a little bit off. So this is why if you've had a very old lock, you need to pull the key in or, or pull the key out or push the key in a little bit to get all the heights just right because of wear like this. So again, pin one, very worn down. Pin five, very different. So there's a couple similar things. So again, we're building a new wear ring around the edge. Uh, the wear on this is also oval for the same reason that the key doesn't go and all the way in and out on pin five it's not getting full range of rotation because it's only touching a very small part of the key, whereas pin one rides the full length of the key. So interesting stuff. Uh, the plug, now you'll be shocked to learn that in all my 5,000 attempts so far, I did not always get it in the keyhole the first try. So the, the, the process for this was that I would put the key all the way in, I'd turn it 360, I'd take the key out x times, right? So in the process of going in and out, then I would chip it against the front. So you'll see stuff like this. Uh, some people see this, which is the shoulder, the thing that stops the key and aligns it properly, uh, touches the face of the plug. Like, that's what it's supposed to do. So if mi any of you have heard of key bumping, people say, oh, this is evidence of key bumping. Um, but without, like, actual knowing what you're talking about or forensic investigation, it, it can be misleading to say so. And I have some examples later. So here's a closer view. Here's the key. Again, those ridges that we saw before are now much deeper. So let's talk about lock picking. Again, the, lock, the act of lock picking in most covert entry techniques is an invasive manipulation of the lock and its components under non-normal scenarios. So what I mean by that is that when you use a key, you take your key, you put the key all the way in, and then you turn. And if it's the correct key, everything is already in the right position, right? And it just rotates, and then you take the key out. If you use the wrong key, it just stops you right away, right? The act of lock picking uses a secondary torque source that is applied before any of the components move. And this is like a key part of why people say, well, it's a brass thing, can't you just use a brass pick or a carbon fiber pick or a fiberglass pick or a 3D printed pick or something like this to avoid evidence? But this act of being required to apply torque before anything is moved kind of defeats some of this. So if you think about the way lock picking works, we're leaving marks in all the places where there are red marks. Uh, the cam, if I didn't mention it, is the piece on the back of the lock that holds the plug to the, um, to the uh, cylinder. Uh, and it also usually has a protrusion that acts as the actuator for the latch, bolt, shackle, so on. So, uh, a lock that has been picked has a number of scratches on it, and it's on a number of parts of the lock that the key cannot do, or in a way that the key cannot create. So, again, typically characterized by a number of scratches in a nonlinear pattern. Now, again, the pins can rotate, so it's hard to say specifically that it was not a key. However, the angle and the direction and the depth and so on uh, help distinguish key marks versus lock picking marks. And as we saw previously, even on pin five, where it's the most scratchy and the most likely to leave scratches, it looks much different than this, right? So this is just a number of, of locks that I took apart. Some of these were picked once, some of these were picked a, a lot of times um, by beginners and, and experts alike. Now, you can tell some interesting characteristics about the lock picker. It's typically, or specifically, how much torque they use, if they're very heavy-handed on the torque, may imply that they are a less skilled lock picker. So you could see very deep marks here. So they're putting too much torque on the lock, causing the pins to get stuck when they're trying to manipulate them, 
leading to bigger marks and so on. Okay, so here a little bit lighter. Uh, you can kind of differentiate single pin picking, which is what this would be, where you're manually probing individually parts of, of each of the pins, versus raking, where you're going in and out uh, with less force per, per pin, so, so to say. Okay, again, single pin picking. We can also tell that this is pin five of this lock because much less wear than the other ones. Now, I teach a lot of you guys to pick locks. Not all of you are good at it. This is a lock that was in my uh, beginner practice picking box for five years, and this is why locks eventually stop working. Here's a lock that's been picked once with a very light touch. Um, even this leaves marks, possibly a little bit hard to see. Uh, during the forensic process, you're not just taking a photo and then examining a photo. You're looking at it with various light sources at various angles and all parts of the pin and so on. But even here, you can see some scratches here, on the left here, up here on the, on the tip. And remember that the amount of use is necessary to wipe some of these traces off is very high, right? So 1,500 uses. How many times, realistically, would a commercial door be used? Say two, three times a day? That's a lot of days before some of that stuff's worn off. And marks are left on different parts of the lock or uh, the pin. So the sides of the pin are a very distinct feature. So the key never touches the sides of the pin because it would just get stuck either going in or coming out of the lock if you think of how it works, right? This is why the key has the slopes in between each of the cuts to help assist it going in and out of the lock without getting stuck. So you can see some scratches coming down the side here, one on the left here, very big. And again, these are in places and, and angles and, and sizes that are not consistent with normal keys. So all the way up the side of the pin, obviously not a key. In the chambers for the pins themselves, again, some place that the key can never get to, you can scratch there with the pick as well. So here's a number of scratches. And from this, you can extrapolate some information like the type of pick they're using, specifically the thickness, uh, usually there's some material transfer between your pick and the lock, even in the case of steel picks and brass locks and so on. Um, you can find marks in places that nothing in the lock touches. So this is a photo of the top of the keyway. So you could see the chamber hole here. This, the, the key cannot touch this place because if it did, you, you wouldn't be able to put your key in the lock because it'd be too tight, right? Um, but here you can see some scratches, again, caused by lock picking. Here's some more. So you might say that this one in the center, like this, this long lateral scratch, is the key. Maybe, right, maybe it had a piece of sand is like the usual example everybody gives. Well, what if I had sand all over my keys? First of all, I don't know what monsters have like their keys in their pocket filled with sand. Um, but it just, it just doesn't work like that. And then a, a mark like this, for example, is just not something the key can do. If it, if it was some protrusion on the key or a miscut key or something, it would happen from the point that the, the key meets the face of the lock to where that cut is, right? It wouldn't just suddenly appear in the back of the lock like this. Here are the places between the chambers. So these are the chambers, and then these are kind of the posts in between separating them. Uh, you could see on that first middle part here, very distinct mark. Again, at an angle inconsistent with key use, inconsistent with anything other than lock picking or manipulation. Now, the, the torque tool that's used, if you looked in the example, you'll, you saw that there's a manipulation tool and a torque tool. Uh, the torque tool also leaves marks uh, depending on where it's placed. So here you could see scratch right here. You'll see scratches if you cut the, the plug in half. You'll see, normally, if, if for those of you who picked a lock, when you put your torque tool in, it usually doesn't sit right the first time, and you have to kind of fiddle with it to get it nice and snug. You'll get this little scratch pattern, like here, trying to get it in the right place. Here's some more. Now, again, uh, beginner lock pickers have a tendency to put the pick all the way through the lock. You, if you've been to DEF CON, you've probably seen people with a pick hanging out the back. Uh, obviously, you can't pick a lock like that. But in locks where they have the cam still on, so like real locks, uh, often beginners will scratch the back of the cam. Now the cam is interesting because it's, it's made from a much different material, typically like very, 
I don't know a better word than shitty, sorry. Very shitty metal. Um, and uh, you'll notice there's lots of corrosion on this because unlike the, the functional moving parts of the lock, it doesn't really matter if this slowly corrodes over time because it's very slow and it doesn't affect the lock functionally. Um, so you could do more advanced stuff like determining when this mark was made based on the corrosion of the surrounding material versus the freshness of the cut. Uh, for picking itself, you, if you, it's a very high profile case, you can do brass oxidation testing. Uh, the idea is like you bite an apple, you let it sit in the air, something happens to it. The same happens with everything to, to some extent. Um, but very expensive, not common to, to do. Again, beginners often really scratch the back of this, so not a normal thing. How many of you know what a pick gun is? I, I was going to add a second part to see if I got more hands up, but... Um, uh, so a pick gun is this uh, tool that looks like a flat piece of metal that slaps all the pins, causing them to jump. It's a locksmithing tool used to open locks, but shockingly, some burglars have tried to use this. Um, and it's a little bit different than lock picking because the way it works is like a spring bias thing that slaps the pins, right? So it's not this act of like probing and moving around with, with tools. It's one motion that snaps. Uh, and in doing so, it leaves very different marks. So characterized by a number of not curvy, uh, flat impressions against all the bases of all the pins. You could tell how many times they pull the trigger. Specifically, if they, uh, a very common mistake is to be slightly touching the cam, because it has an arc of motion. So often they'll just put it all the way in and then snap it. And so you could see how many times they use that Another great material transfer, because this is a, a much more invasive process than the act of picking, where you're scraping in, a, in one big motion things from the lock. So if you find a pick-on on a suspect, you can do advanced material testing to say, does this pick-on have residue from this lock? And the, the metals and the data manufacturer, estimated data manufacturer of a lot of these is so specific that it's enough to tie people to places, which is a, a vehicle for investigation and, and suspect identification and so on. How many of you know what key bumping is? So funnily enough, pick guns and key bumping work on the same fundamental principle, this idea that by applying kinetic force via some delivery mechanism, you cause the pins to jump. So in the case of the pick gun, it's this swinging arm. In the case of key bumping, it's a key with a special cut pattern being hit into the lock. So key bumping is very uh, strong in, in terms of like covert entry. It's, it's sort of like very lightly destructive, not that your lock won't work, but it's much more impactful than some of the other stuff we've talked about. You can expect to see marks in a lot of these places. So again, we are taking a, a cut key, it's not a working key, otherwise you wouldn't need anything to do but turn the key. But you're taking a cut key, you're hitting it into the lock, causing big dents across all the key pins, right? So that's not normal, right? This is not something a key normally does. And I've met some pretty heavy-handed people, but I've never seen somebody go, Whoa, you know, in one clean motion to, to get their key in the lock. Right? You can tell based on the, the very microscopic uh, pattern of the, the marks whether or not it was a handmade bump key, a machine bump key, so on. So here, the marks are much more scratchy, more likely to be a hand-filed or dremeled key than a nicely cut key off a machine. Uh, key bumping has an interesting effect on the pins itself because unlike lock picking where we're more or less just pushing them up and down against the spring, we're, we're violently impacting them with uh, typically brass on brass or steel on brass. And as a result, it causes deformations over time to the plug shape. So it'll slowly stretch out the, the chambers in different ways. Because imagine what happens, it, for those of you who've never done this, it doesn't just work with one hit. Sometimes it takes 5, 10, 20 hits to do this. Um, and the idea is that you, if it doesn't work, what's happening is that the key is being slammed into a pin, and that pin is trying to move under the force of the key going against it, right? So it slowly deforms the chamber sizes and shapes. So you can see here, the sides of it are now starting to work. Now, we talked earlier, uh, the shoulder is what stops the key from going into the lock. So in the process of key bumping, you're impacting the shoulder of the key into the plug, the face of the plug. The, the marks look much different than normal wear, though, as you hopefully can see now. Uh, 
as a result of some of the bumping techniques, some of them put the key in further than is intended, and as you know from looking at your keys, they get thicker towards the bow of the key. And the plug will, in some keys and some brands of lock, will expand as it tries to accommodate this violent force of hitting the key a little bit deeper into the lock than it was intended. So you'll get this curling effect around the edge of the keyhole on the, the plug face. So bypass is a generic technique for things that try and bypass the components that detain the lock from rotating or, or actuating. Um, so in a typical lock, again, we have a plug which is connected to an actuator. In a lot of designs, the actuator is not secured, so you can stick something in and manually turn the actuator without moving any of the pins, for example. Um, there's a very uh, fun case of this in an American padlock uh, many years ago. So this is the American 700. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It's just like that silver puck padlock uh, with the American logo. Master lock bought American lock, so if you bought a lock recently, you haven't seen it. But in any event, the cam was exposed, so you can shove a picking tool, like a very thick pick tool in there, and just turn it and undo the shackle of the padlock without moving any of the pins. Because even though they're mechanically coupled in terms of like when the plug moves, that moves, it's not, in this lock, they, they weren't required to move together, if that makes sense. So you shove something in there and you turn it. Uh, obviously, this is going to leave a mark. So you see on the, the right side of this, there's some deformation to the, the brass caused by the tool being wedged in there. Um, this is actually a very interesting story to me as a lock person and a security person. So the company said, oh, oh, is that right? So they patched it. How did they patch it? This is a mechanical thing. They released a little disc with a part number and everything. It's a steel disc, and you put the disc over this so that it blocks it, and now you can't shove your tool in. And the locksmithing supply company that made the tool said, oh, oh, is that right? Oh, well then. So they made a tool to punch a hole in the metal disc. <laughs> um, so this is the disc. This is what it looks like when it blocks an attempt to do this. Uh, I, I have no desire to like smash holes in my, my stuff, but you can imagine a hole here. Uh, if you look this up, Bypass American 700, there's lots of documentation on this. I thought it was a very fascinating story of like cat and mouse on the physical side of things, uh, where it's not so easy to patch things that, that are installed in the field. So uh, very quickly, we'll talk about keys. So analysis of keys is often a part of this. Uh, stolen keys are a big thing. Duplicated keys are a big thing. All of this can be, to some extent, tracked and, and analyzed forensically. Uh, specifically whether or not keys are original, so specifically if they are aftermarket keys, copied keys, factory original keys, so on. So when, it, when a key is stolen or, or copied, then the, the duplicate key is not the original typically. It's typically a third party blank or made manually using a, a mill or something like this. Now 3D printing is obviously popular. Um, determining if a key is factory original is like a very complex material analysis of how the key was made when it was made, the, the manufacturing methods of it. And also there's other things. So if you go to like a, a corner locksmith, they will have a, typically a manual key copying machine. So you clamp in a, a source key and you clamp in a copy key. And it, it clamps it in there. And in clamping it, you leave a mark on the copy key. And from this, you can also extrapolate like what machine it was based on the pattern of the clamp and all this you know, more advanced stuff. Um, some of these use a stylus, so it's a metal bar that rides the key so that it moves a cutting wheel with the bar to figure out what should the pattern of cuts be. Uh, in doing so, it's scraping a metal piece against the source key, so you can determine if, if the source key was copied using a machine like this. Uh, some very advanced forensic analysis can be done to determine if two keys were copied on the same machine using this method based on microscopic evidence of the, the pattern that that stylus leaves on, that, on the key that it copies. Handmade keys are actually pretty easy to spot just because they it's very hard to make a handmade key that looks like it wasn't handmade. Uh, typically done via file, Dremel, sandpaper, so on. Uh, you can obviously from Traditional tool mark analysis, you can figure out what type of file was used and all this kind of stuff, what type of Dremel was used. And again, tie these back to a suspect if, you, if they're found with a Dremel or something suspected of copying a key. 
Uh, another interesting thing is that you could tell based on the pattern of duplications for a, a man, a automatic key copier what machine made it. So you can tell based on the size of cuts, the speed of cuts, uh, the, the angles that the machine takes and, and so on to figure out did, you know, key A, was this made on a XYZ machine version 5 or whatever, right? So bumping, for bump keys, obviously leave evidence. So as the bump keys used, it deforms based on impact. You can see here a big hole. So very easy to tell if a key was used to bump something. Uh, again, just like how the plug face takes damage, the bump key shoulder takes damage. So again, from there, you'll see that there's some material transfer between the target lock and this. Uh, for other things, you could see if tools or uh, keys were put in tools. So this is an example of vice grips being used against a key. Very distinct tool mark, which then can be compared to uh, vice grips found on, on somebody's person and so on. Uh, impressioning in terms of copying keys is also very popular. So I'm sure many of you have seen the clamshell kits and other kinds of like wax, silicon impressioning. Uh, sometimes very difficult to clean the keys and uh, also a very pristine looking key is very unusual in the same sense that, you know, a very pristine looking lock is unusual. One of the things people said, well, hey, data, I got it. We're going to pick the lock. We're going to disassemble it. We're going to put new pins in. And I said, well, they're probably not going to look the same as a lock that has existed there for 10 years or something, right? And they said, oh, we'll figure out how many times they use it a day and then we'll do it. And, you know, this is the what if game that we don't want to play. Uh, but yeah, so clay residue is very common for thing, things like this, because usually it's not very nice, uh, you know, casting clay. It's, it's whatever was at the hobby store used to do this, which is then not inspected very thoroughly to clean off. So that's kind of it, just like a brief overview of this. Um, I know, I'm sure many of you have questions. Um, happy to take them. I know Katie wanted to work on a lock picking workshop sometime in the future. So bother Katie if you want that to happen here. Okay, just me and you. Okay. <laughs> um, question. The, the question is, what is the difference between a medical lock and a standard lock, and why is it more secure? Uh, Medico uses two things. So the first is what's called a sidebar, which is a secondary set of cuts. And that interfaces with a secondary locking mechanism. So it's like a, a two-part lock in some sense. Now, again, what did we learn? Everything is checked one at a time. So depending on which way you rotate and the specifics of the lock, you will either bind the pins or the sidebar first, and Medico is pickable as a result because physics, right? Every lock is pickable as a result. Um, second is that Medico uses what's called axial rotation. So the pins are not just raised to a position. They must be raised and rotated. This is provided by angled cuts on the key, which rotate the, the pins in one of three orientations to interface with the sidebar. Um, so I wouldn't say they're impossible to pick, but certainly they're, they're a big step up from the crappy Kwikset and Schlage locks that you normally buy. Not that Schlage and Kwikset don't make good locks, but the ones you buy at the hardware store, store, shockingly, the $10 locks you buy are not good locks. <laughs> Question? Or, yeah, yeah. I can That's, hear you. Okay. We got right. this. Uh, to an experienced lock picker, um, how long does it take to pick the typical home lock? What is, the question is, what is the average time to pick a typical residential lock? Under a minute, probably. Again, depends on the lock, depends on the specifics. Um, your, your back door lock is probably worse than your front door lock, which has an impact on it. it things like that. The considerations people don't have, right? Sorry, there's... A common, a common source of the steel for picks, I noticed that you showed us the side of the profile of a worm gear uh, hose clamp and early on when you showed us a pick. Do you remember that? Uh, I don't think I showed a pick other than an animation of a pick. Well, in your animation, oh, okay, the sure. raking pick is from a, from a stainless steel hose clamp. 
There we go. Very familiar. No, no. Oh, you're saying the, the slots? So this, this is no, actually no, no. just... The, the, the pick itself, those, those slots are the slots you'll find in a hose clamp. And, and the uh, hose clamp is what people commonly use to make these picks. And those are going to be 304, 305, maybe 410 stainless. My question is about, it's, it's irrelevant that they come from hose clamps. But sure. A lot of them do come from hose Well, just, just to interrupt, this is actually not from a hose clamp. It's just that the, the person who made this slide designed a pick that looks like that, okay. which just happens to be similar to a hose clamp slots. <laughs> well, there we but go. But continue. <laughs> Please. So the, the question was actually about um, how you're identifying trace elements of the material left behind. Are you using electron microscopy? Are you using... What do you use? Uh, so again, we talked about how I didn't go to school. So what I use is I say, hey, lab, tell me what's in this, and they figure it out. Uh, I believe the process they're using is mass spec, typically. Um, but I, I am honestly not smart enough to answer this question. Oh, wait, here, Sorry, I'm, you got to find the there. microphone. I'm coming. Go here first. Thank you. We'll get um, sorry, so my basic question was, what's the scale, you mentioned briefly in the passing that you don't use forensic lock picking for your average burglary, say. That's correct. Um, so I'm kind of curious, because I'm imagining Mission Impossible in my head right now. Um, <laughs> what is the scale of operations that um, requires forensic lock picking? And uh, beyond that, what would approximately, if I had to put a pa price tag on it, um, what would one, uh, mounting one of these operations cost to figure out you know, how a certain lock was picked if the lock is made of, for national security? So to, to answer your first question, again, this is only done by insurance as a requirement. Law enforcement, military, obviously intelligence circles for very uh, small scale applications of this. They're not inspecting every lock ever. Certain military facilities will routinely do like preventative maintenance where they take off all the locks on a small subset of doors to in inspect them. But otherwise, this is not done regularly, I, I would say. Um, and for price tag, uh, it's hard to say because it depends if you're asking me as an employee, right? So I work for a facility, am I doing that? Then obviously it's just whatever that guy's normal salary is versus is a courtroom testimony required because that's a, uh, not, not a very high price tag in a general sense, but like it's required that you charge for it in, in many places. Gotcha. Thank you. I was just sort of asking what the intended it, audience expensive, was, which you answered. I guess is the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Leo life experience. I my home key. I lost my home keys, so I called the locksmith. And he used very weird techniques. I don't know if that's common, but he put a plastic bag with uh, some kind of keys, and within less than three seconds, he able to open it, but the lock is gone. I got to buy, spend lots of money to buy a new one. So his question is, is this a common practice? What is the rational behind? Or he's just a shitty locksmith? <laughs> well, so I, I, I'd say he got the lock open, right? Yeah, less than three seconds. So he can't be that bad of a locksmith. So uh, what the gentleman said, in, in case you didn't hear it in the back, was the, the locksmith put some sort of plastic over a key, put it in the lock, opened the lock very rapidly. Uh, this is what's called, well, but he took the lock. Yeah, of course, because he wants to sell you a new one, because that one sucks. He got it open in three seconds, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but the, the, what this is called is, is self-impressioning. So certain locks, again, think of how this works. When you put a key in, even if it's wrong, the lock checks if it's in the right position. So traditional impressioning is this process of putting a blank key in, applying torque, and then wiggling the key. And since the component that's being bound cannot move, it leaves a mark on the key, and then you file it a little bit. And you repeat this process until you have a working key. Self-impressioning is like the same thing, but the act of just wiggling the key causes it to set all the things on your plastic key very rapidly and just open the lock. Um, so if you want to look it up, it's called self-impressioning or plastic impressioning later. It doesn't break anything. I, I, I don't know if I can answer if it's a scam or not, because I, I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, like, that's a motive question that I, I don't know if I can answer. Um, but it, it is a common technique that I'm actually surprised your locksmith knew, because most, most people don't do that. But again, it depends on the type of lock. Most normal pin tumbler locks are not susceptible to this, 
So maybe it was a wafer lock, which is a very low security lock, or something, something, something. Right? If each specific key is assigned to one specific, um, like, five-cylinder thing, how does the master key work that could open, like, 20, 20 locks? Sure. So how, how does master keying work in a pin yep. to the lock? So in our example, we have one bottom pin, a key pin, and one driver pin, right? So there's only one position in which these can meet to allow the inner piece to rotate, right? In master keying, they add a, a third pin, and now there's two places at which it can meet. It can either be key pin is at the shear line or the other set of pins is at the shear line, right? Does that make sense? You want a visual aid? I think we can make this go. Hold on. Now, if I accidentally pull up porn, <laughs> I'm just saying, it's all in the game, right? I think it should be the first slide of this, if I'm not mistaken. Or porn. <laughs> so here is an example of a master key lock. Does this make more sense? So now there's three pins. And again, if you have a five pin lock and one of the chambers has a master pin, now two keys work. If two of the chambers have master pins, how many, how many work? None of you went to math class. <laughs> you could say, come on, get that credit. Four, gentleman is correct, four keys work, and so on. So this lock has many different keys that work on it because each of the chambers is master keyed. Right? So this is, this is typical of like a very large installation where you have a grand master key and then a sub grand master and you know, specific area master keys and so on and so on. So that is how Master King works in a nutshell. They add pins. Okay. We're just going to do the whole lock picking <laughs> workshop right now. Right, right now. If you've done this in court or mm -hmm. testified in court, uh, when you analyze the scratches on, say, a pin or whatever, is that treated like, like it's definitely true, like DNA or something? Or will the the question Defense is how argued. accepted is forensic locksmithing testimony? Um, so again, most people do not know how locks work. And lock, forensic locksmithing is a subset of traditional tool mark forensics in the same sense that ballistics is a subset of traditional tool mark forensics. Um, the, the hard part is not seeing the scratches, right? Everybody could visually see the scratches typically. The hard part is explaining why that is and what that is as well as, again, we talked about, what, five, six different techniques? There's, there's hundreds of different ways to open locks without even getting into high security, very specific tools to open specific locks. So the testimony is typically accepted, and there's a very small number of people in the world who do this specifically for forensic locksmithing. Obviously, there's a lot of tool mark investigators out there. Um, so I think it's one of those sciences where typically it speaks for itself, and until you start getting into things like skill level and time requirements, which are a, a little less objective, uh, more subjective, then typically it's not been a problem for me. But the problem for me is that I'm young, and the, the opposing uh, expert is like twice my age, and there's like a mental thing most juries have where they trust, that he's like, oh, that guy has 30 more years of experience than data, so he must be right. It's been more of a problem for me. Now, it's not always required that I present the, the testimony. I can provide a report which is submitted as evidence and then used by prosecution or defense as a piece of evidence that can be discussed and analyzed as part of this, right? Um, but I think most cases don't get to the point where they are hinging on forensic locksmithing-based evidence. It's more of a starting point for figuring out, like, who done it and, and tying people to places than it is for establishing motive and other things like that, if that makes sense, which, which are much more deterministic in terms of uh, how cases are won or lost, I, I feel. Are there any questions? I am working on the age thing, though, but it's a process. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in this example, since you have more pins, does that mean if you're picking it, you have more chances to get it aligned that you can feel? That's correct. So the, the comment was, in a master keyed system, you, you, it's easier to pick as a result of having more possible shear lines. Yes, absolutely. And, and is there a way to know if the, your lock has this besides, I guess, picking it and feeling it? and or Disassembly. Okay. You, you could tell via disassembly. You can't tell by looking at it. I mean, I've been working with locks a long time, but I haven't 
like been able to get it, that part yet. Can you feel like that there's two of them there? Or question is, can you feel that there's two of them there? Uh, it's very difficult because you see they're much smaller than than a typical pin. So these are spaced such that they are one key depth or two key depths or three key depths or something like this based on the brand of lock. So unless you like very methodically feel out and like intentionally overlift to try and catch the other possible shear line for that chamber, it's very difficult to like intuit that. Uh, and, and as far as me, pick, the act of picking a lock, you just want to open the lock. You don't care about decoding the lock, which is to, to derive what the key should be via manipulation. There's, there's other decoding techniques that do care about that. But in lock picking, it's like a frantic process at you versus time, more so than establishing what the key is. So in the uh, cat and mouse game that you say is going on in this street, is that going on at all levels? I'm curious from the sense of the $25 lock at Home Depot, is there an active cat and mouse game there? Or is it like, no, those locks, you can be open in three seconds, deal. So th that's actually a very good question. The question is, does the cat and mouse game on the physical sec security side of the house happen at low security as well as high security? So it obviously definitely happens at the high security level. Um, more so for patent expirations than for true innovation, right? So, like, if I challenge you guys in this room to name more than six American lock manufacturers or locks that you can buy in America, I think most of you would be pretty hard-pressed to get above that number. Whereas uh, Rainier from Europe probably has no problem doing this because there's a dozen or two dozen countries very fiercely competing versus us, we're like, dude, we got QuickSet, we got Masterlog, we got Schlage, that's part solved, done, right? And without going to a specialty locksmith, you're unlikely to ever see a high security lock or what I would consider a high security lock or a medium security lock if you wanna get very specific, right? So like a Medico, I would say, is a medium security lock compared to the super exotic expensive stuff that I would really think of as a high security lock. Um, and the cat and mouse game only happens when there's industry or social pressure to do so. So a good example of this is key bumping. Key bumping was a, an idea that's been around for a long time. The first recorded notion of key bumping is in the 1920s when a patent was filed for a really old, like comically complex key bumping tool where it was like this, you know, very complicated thing that holds a key. But if you look at it, you go, that is, that is a bump key. It's just the way of delivering the bump key it wasn't just a hammer. It was like this complex Rube Goldbergian thing, right? But 1920, right? So locksmithing, the community of locksmiths, very seasoned veteran locksmiths knew about it, though it wasn't widely used to open locks, but they understood that this was possible. So in 2005, this was published by lock pickers because they were like, holy shit, this, this is a problem, right? And the locksmithing community had a very bad reaction to that. And they were like, you're publishing trade secrets and so on. And the way I viewed it was kind of like computers in the mid-90s when security vulnerabilities were suddenly started being published, like very widespread. And the industry freaks out and says, you can't do that. You know, what are you doing, right? Then they'll know about our problems and things like this. And so I think the tech community obviously moves very quickly. And locks are about 10 or 15 years behind that. So we had the initial outcry from bumping. Some companies uh, in particular, well basically every company that could started trying to sell a bump proof or bump resistant lock. Some worked, some didn't, just as a result of like, they don't really understand what it was. So uh, for those of you who own a QuickSet smart key, this is the lock that has user rekeyable features. You could tell because it has a little hole to the left of the keyway used for the rekeying function. This was made as an anti-bumping thing. So. The, the, the way it's anti-bumping is that it doesn't use pins in the same sense. So if it's not a pin lock, you can't bump it, therefore this is bump proof. Not that it's a great lock, but yes, fundamentally you are correct. It's like technically correct, it is bump proof. Um, and Schlage copied this, they made the secure key, they were sued by QuickSet, now you can't buy that. Um, <laughs> other companies have, have made locks that are just not pin locks. But other than that, there hasn't been really there's not a lot of motion because again, think, think of yourselves, think of what you realistically do. You go to the hardware store, you see 10 locks that all look basically exactly the same. Which one do you buy? The cheap one, of course, right? So what, what impetus is there for the company to make a better lock? So you are the problem. Um, but, but do you know what I'm saying? That's why, and, and some of the improvements they can make are like fractions of a cent 
But they're like, well, who cares? You know, because then they'd have to charge a dollar more, and then you wouldn't buy it. And All right. Um, is there some tips to buying a good lock that you would recommend? That's a crazy good question, sir. Uh, so tips to buying a good lock. So anything you can buy at the hardware store probably sucks. Just like in a general grand scheme of things, right? And then also you got to be realistic with yourself. It's not computers. You can't just like for free get the better encryption in the, in the same sense in the physical world, right? Digital decisions are much more simplified in that I'll just go with a better thing. But it doesn't cost you anything usually. Physical, if you want a good lock, you, you can buy from a number of manufacturers. You're restricted by the mounting options for the door. So like, will it actually go on your door? So most European locks, the standard European lock does not go on an American style door. because they, It's just different, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, realistically, the only high security locks you can buy in the US are Medico. Multi-lock, you can buy a high security Schlage, which would be Schlage Primus, is their, their high security line. Uh, and then you can buy something online, like if you want a padlock, it's a little bit easier, but a door lock, you'll need to make sure you buy the actual correct format of door lock and all this kind of stuff. Um, if you want to buy like the, what I think the best bang for your buck is, if that's helpful, I would buy an Abloy. It's an excellent lock that is not going to get picked, not going to get bumped. Probably not going to get open aside from destructive entry. You can also buy a buy lock. is an Australian lock that's sold very commonly online. Also a very good lock. Again, unlikely to be picked, bumped, so on. Um, but in the U.S., you, your really only options are Schlage, Medico, Multilock. And I'd be surprised if you get anything other than that. If you want to go online, again, Abloy, A-B-L-O-Y, buy lock. And there's many others, but... Th those would probably be the easiest to acquire for, for an American consumer. Yep, thank you, CG and Rudy.